Well, welcome, welcome, welcome to our weekly uh, live stream. Uh, let's take care of our, we always like to start out with some housekeeping. So uh, while I'm doing a housekeeping and admin, go ahead and feel free to uh, chat amongst yourselves. Uh, Let us know what uh, series exam you're taking. Uh, that's helpful, uh, you know, uh, particularly in terms of, you know, whether you have questions and uh, where you're joining us from. Uh, I know we have some international uh, students as well. We always like to start our live streams with a little brief and debrief. You know, I was in the Marine Corps. My job was to brief pilots on the way up and see what they might encounter, tell them what they might encounter. and when they come back down, debrief them uh, so they can pass pay it forward and tell us what we should tell uh, people on the next mission. And that's the same thing. So brief is telling us to test takers what they might encounter on the seven, you know, high probability, low probability, where they should worry about it or not. Debrief is, uh, you know, from successful victorious test takers. Now, again, every draw is a little different on the exam. So uh, SIE brief, uh, thank goodness this person asked me, do they have to worry about the M1, M2, and M3 on the money supply on the SEIE exam? No. You will encounter monetary policy, the money supply, on both the SIE exam and the 65 exam. And you need to know that monetary policy is controlled by the Federal Reserve Board. You need to know the tools uh, of the Fed in terms of buying and selling government securities and its impact on the money supply and most importantly, you know, the way they uh, raise or lower interest rates to do that. Um, definitely testable. And, you know, the mandate of the Federal Reserve Board monetary policy is price equilibrium, price stability, and uh, full employment. So definitely need to know that. Uh, on debrief, had somebody take a Series 7. Whatever you're not prepared for, that's what you're going to swear you had a lot of. And uh, this person swore they had five, six, seven variable annuity questions. I, I think that's unlikely. Uh, variable annuities are on the 6, they're on the 7, they're on the 65, 66. Pretty straightforward, the test issues on variable annuities. But you're funding it with after-tax money. I think of it as a variable annuity as a mutual fund with an insurance wrapper. Their money goes tax-deferred. And if you do a random distribution, it's going to be last money's in, first money out. You annuitize. Life only gives you the largest monthly check. The check goes up or down based on the assumed interest rate. Uh, we've been getting reports on 6566 about a federally tax exempt mutual fund question. And uh, be careful on uh, federally tax exempt mutual fund because it's a little different. You know, usually we would say that if you reinvest dividends, a dividend reinvestment program, a drip, that even though you're reinvesting the dividends, that's still going to be taxable. But remember, in a tax exempt mutual fund, the dividends represent the interest from the tax free muni bonds. So the dividends are not taxable in a federally tax exempt mutual fund on the federal level. And then thank God again, that's debrief. And then brief said somebody asked, are they gonna have to calculate? Last week it was, do I have to calculate the standard deviation? The answer is no. This week was, do I have to calculate alpha? You do not. You know, uh, I worry about people on NASA exams getting too far into the weeds on, you know, quantitative analysis. You know, for example, on alpha, you just gotta understand that's the excess return over beta. You're not going to make you do the calculation, just recognize inputs and outputs, right? I'm oversimplifying, which is my job. But if you know beta is a measurement of volatility as compared to the S&P 500, and it's a beta of two, market goes up 10% or down 10%. I expect my investment to go up or down 20%, twice up or down. It works both ways. And then alpha could be negative or positive, but let's do positive. Uh, I'm expecting from beta 10% market move. It's beta two, goes up 23%, 3% would be that alpha. Now, in terms of when I turn to and start answering questions, if you could be as uh, kind enough to put SIE or Series 7, whatever your question is, with a capital Q followed by your question, that's very helpful because then I can distinguish it from the chat amongst the test takers who are chatting amongst yourselves, which is encouraged and uh, great about coming here Tuesday, right? Similar situation. And then it also avoids me having to say, well, you know, is this the SIE or 7? Because well, the test questions are different. On some questions, it's low probability, low risk, and other exams, it's high probability, high risk. So it's helped me answer the question if I first am told what exam that you are taking. It's also helpful when I go to, you know, uh, on replay, uh, I timestamp it, and it helps people if they're looking for like alpha or whatever, they can go right to that rather than watching all that. Uh, the channel is the best free supplement to your paid study materials. I've organized it 
by the playlist. So you'd go to your playlist for your exam, SIE, for example, and you'd find, you know, 40 plus videos. I have them in suggested watch order, but it's a buffet. Take what you like, uh, you know, leave what you don't. It is hard with over 200 hours of content and providing content for every series exam to keep it organized. And so a lot of times I put uh, extra content not on the channel. I put it on uh, the Reddit R Series 7. I do little video explications when people have questions. I say, well, I'll make a video and I'll put it up there for you. And that way I don't have like 400 videos on the YouTube channel. So you can find it there. I also post those uh, explications to the Facebook Series 7 Guru page. So, you know, if you're looking, for example, we had a guy yesterday, he's looking for help on a combination. I said, well, simply put combination into the search bar on R Series 7 and you'll see me do making four videos on combinations that would not be found on the YouTube channel. In terms of paid supplements, uh, I don't know where my buddy Brian is, but uh, Kaplan is a paid supplement. If you use my Guru 10 discount code at checkout, you get 10% off. Uh, as a paid supplement, if you don't have a Kaplan QBank, I highly recommend it. It's like 45 bucks for the SIE QBank. It's about 60 bucks for the 7 QBank. And then Brian uh, Teske gives our uh, people, our viewers and subscribers, 20% off on Teske material. He has uh, some great uh, videos, supplements, and he also has some uh, practice tests that are pretty good. If you'd like help with a question and the live stream is not going on, you can send those uh, requests uh, to me and I'm more than happy, well, I'm more than happy to uh, uh, either send you the email or make a video or put it here. Uh, my email address for those would be deantenny at gmail.com. Just tell me uh, what you're interested in. I'll be more than happy to send that your way. Okay, with that being said, uh, welcome, Justin. So Justin's question is, Series 7 exam on Monday. Thank you for following the format. Where should I be spending my time in this final week? Well, you've got actually the timeline is not collapsing. I kind of think of your study effort as uh, kind of like an option. You know, options are a wasting asset, time value erodes. Uh, I would ask you, Justin, have you done any practice exams yet? And what are you getting on those practice test scores? So what I would like to know is, have you done a practice test, taken an intellectual inventory, and got a mark. What I'm hoping is you've done that. If you haven't, that should be your first thing to do is get a mark and see where you're at. Now I'm looking, what I'm looking for is your fake accountability partner, Justin, is that you get over a 70% plus on a practice test. Because that means you're where you need to be in terms of testing Monday. But you know, right now you still have time to do what's called remediation. And we got to embrace negative feedback to see if perhaps remediation is necessary or not. We do that by taking a practice exam. Uh, second thing I would recommend, the second thing I would recommend is making sure you go to the uh, FINRA website and print the Series 7 content outline. The Series 7 content outline tells you the critical functions of being a broker. There are four. Function one is finding a customer. Function two is opening an account. Function three is investment vehicles. And function four is what happens after we, you know, make an investment. Now, of those functions, the biggest one, Justin, is function three. That's 91 questions. And so you ask what you should do. Stay focused on function three. That's going to be stocks, uh, bonds, options, mutual funds, uh, partnerships. So you want to stay focused on those investment vehicles. Uh, a lot of people say, oh, man, there's so much suitability. Well, suitability is based on the investment vehicles, and you can't answer a suitability question if you don't have a good handle on the investment vehicles. Now, of those investment vehicles, uh, make sure you're spending time on munis. Municipals are about 20 questions. Uh, I would suggest, Justin, taking a sheet of paper and folding it in half, and on one side, write all the terms associated with municipal bonds, GOs. And on the other part, side of the page, everything associated with revenue. Because a big part of those mini bond questions is distinguishing between GOs and revenues. For example, GO taxes, revenue user fees, GO ad valerum taxes, uh, GO collection ratio, that kind of thing. Uh, revenue bonds, feasibility study, debt service coverage ratio, flow of funds. And so I would recommend that. Options is another 20 questions, plus or minus five questions. So spend a lot of time on options. And then uh, mutual funds. Don't underestimate mutual funds. 
mutual funds. I call that whole area package products. Make sure you uh, know the distinction between closed and an open end funds. You're going to get tons of questions there. Uh, make sure you know the difference between an open end fund and an ETF. Make sure you know the difference between ETFs and ETNs. So uh, big time test waters. So the three biggest ones are options, munis, and mutual funds. So that would be my recommendation for you. Uh, if I were your real accountability partner, the other thing, Justin, I would ask you is how many practice exams when am I going to see from you between now and Monday? Are you going to do give me one every other day? Or are you going to give me? I'm a, listen, I'm not a real accountability. A real accountability partner is the person at your firm, you know, who can hire or fire you if you don't get it done. And I know some of us are doing it on our own. And if you are, then I think my channel and these live streams are more important because, you know, you don't have a, a built in cohort or community at your sponsoring broker dealer. So that being said, I'd also have want to have a commitment, Justin, uh, about, uh, you know, how many practice exams uh, I'm going to see from you between now and Monday. Um, you need to fold up your study effort Sunday morning. So, you know, that's uh, how confident you are. It depends on how much work you're going to do Sunday. But Sunday night is really just about putting on your game face and getting a good night's sleep because reading is so important. So, you know, RTFQ, read the full question. And when I'm tired, man, my reading skills really diminish. And then RTFA, read the full answer set. So maybe Sunday you want to maybe do in a practice exam. Maybe not. Just go over your notes, but keep it low key uh, on Sunday. Make sure you're well rested. Uh, I have made a video that's been very popular called Series 7 in 60 Minutes uh, that uh, people have been listening to the night before or morning of their exam just to kind of, again, do that intellectual kind of inventory or checklist. So those would be my recommendations for you in terms of the final week. Now, uh, if you have a Kaplan Q Bank, uh, I just I'll speak to that. Kaplan Q Banks has performance trackers where you can actually, from the questions, know where your weak areas are. And so that's the other thing you want to do is continually base knowledge, particularly on the areas we discussed. So you have time to circle back if you're, you know, you're having weak performance in munis or weak performance in options. Hopefully you can isolate some of those topics where maybe you want to go back and read some more. Uh, maybe you want to go back and do uh, some quizzes on that. Maybe you want to watch some videos on that. So uh, that would be the other thing I would add to the mix is practice tests and delaying more base. Continue to delay more base as you uh, move uh, forward towards uh, Monday. Make sure you circle back and, uh, you know, let us know what happened to you. Uh, let's see. I was wondering if there's a simple way to memorize buy stops, sell stops, buy limits. <laughs> so, Gerardo, um, I don't know. There are memory aids. Let me get a whiteboard here. Uh, let's see. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. Share screen. To share screen sharing, share screen. Uh, can you guys uh, see the whiteboard there? Can you just let me know uh, that you can see that whiteboard? I'm assuming the whiteboard is showing up on the on the screen. Anyways, uh, let's just put a uh, market price here. Uh, market price would be, you know, well, let me see, where's my Gerardo? Let me kill Gerardo here for a sec. Uh, let me kill the banners. And we have what's called slobs over bliss. Slobs over bliss. And I just let me see if I can get this thing working. Oh, well, there we go. Okay. And then that back of business. Sorry about that. Okay. So here's our current market price. So for example, uh, Apple is at 140 today. And so we have what's called slobs over bliss. And slob stands for, I think a lot of people get hung up because they think there's a zillion types of orders. There's not. There's market orders and there's limit orders. And so if it's a sell, lot, sell limit or buy stop on Apple, Apple's at 140. Let's put that here. And uh, you want to sell it, you're going to put in your buy limit and say, hey, Dean, I want to sell Apple at 141 or better. There's always an implied or better. So that's the market price of uh, Apple. Or if you have a short position in Apple, I don't think that's very smart. But if you say, Dean, I want to stop the loss. I'm going to short Apple at 140 and I want to stop the loss at approximately... A 143 
And I say, Gerardo, do you want to put in a uh, buy stop that if we pull the trigger turns into a market order? Or do you want to put in a buy stop that if we pull the trigger turns into a limit order? So sell limits and buy stops are above the market. Uh, very test will know that Gerardo, we use stop orders to stop losses, protect profits and establish stock positions. So whatever it is three of a thing, they love the accept format. So a stop order is used to stop a loss. In this example, a short position, protect a profit, you know, if we shorted Apple at 160, now it's 140, we place our buy stop to protect that profit or to establish a stock position. So, you know, I don't want to buy Apple because it's stuck in the trading range. So I call my broker and say, hey, let's put in a buy stop above the resistance line. And that way, when Apple breaks through, we'll establish that position. And then the other one we're going to use here is a memory aid is bliss. Now, I do have a whole video and that video is called Tips, Tricks and Memory Aids. And uh, it's about 40 minutes on just a lot of memory work here. And Bliss is to remind us that we're going to place buy limits and sell stops below the market. So if Apple's 140, you know, this isn't the lecture. I have an entire lecture on this, but it'd be foolish for you, Gerardo, to tell me you want to buy Apple at 141 or less with the Apple at 140. I'd say you must be new. I'm here for you. you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to buy Apple 140 and fill you at 141. So it would behoove you to put that below there. And then the same thing with a sell stop. That's going to be used to stop a loss, protect a profit, or establish a stock position. You know, when I was a baby broker decades ago, I uh, said to this guy at cold call in this country club, and I said, hey, listen, why don't we open a new account and buy a 1,000 shares at 50? Uh, over the next 12, 18 months, I think it could be a $100 stock. And if I'm right, you're going to double your money. But I could just as easily be wrong. And if I'm wrong, it could be a $20 stock. And God knows I don't want you to lose 30 grand. So what I'd like to do is open the new account, buy a thousand shares at 50 and place a sell stop at 47. That way we lose, we stop the loss, we pull the weed. You know, part of successful investing is letting the flowers bloom and pulling the weeds. And here we, you know, we want to pull the weed and we'd lose approximately $3,000. In that example, I'm using it to stop a loss, right? So that's where we place those orders in relationship to the current market price. Uh, I would also know we adjust orders below the market. So if it's an order below the market, we're going to adjust it uh, for that. Uh, so I hope that was helpful. Uh, let me just go back to Gerardo and see if I did that. Um, I, I think I would start Gerardo by saying, just remember, there's only two types of orders, market orders and limit orders. And the only order, Gerardo, that has no qualification, no contingency is a market order. Everything else has some kind of contingency or qualifier and a, a buy limit or sell limit, it's my price or better. You know, sometimes my brokers say, Dean, are you buying the office lunch? I say, yeah, I'm buying the office lunch on a limit order of 500 bucks. If we can't feed this office for $500 or less, don't be looking at me. Now, if I didn't give my brokers a limit order, they'd be willing pheasant under glass in uh, for lunch. So there's this implied or better. So, uh, and then know where they're placed in relationship to the uh, market. And then remember when we have a stop, when we pull the trigger, if this, then that. I'm telling my broker, if the stock trades at or through 47, pull the trigger. And when we pull the trigger, it's either going to be a market order or a limit order, right? So, you can, you know, the more contingent qualifiers you add. Now, I have a video on that, Gerardo. I'll tell you what I'll do. When I timestamp this video, Gerardo, I'll put a link to my uh, trading securities video that is about 45 minutes on types of orders and memory aid devices. Uh, one more point, Gerardo, we wouldn't want our order triggered as a result of a cash dividend. So orders below the market, buy limits and sell stops, bliss, a sell stop that turns into market or a sell stop turns into limit, doesn't matter, is going to be adjusted for cash dividends. Uh, thank you, Tyler, for joining us. Uh, we've opened up the call for nines and tens. For those of you who don't know the various series exams, uh, Tyler is working on being what's called a sales supervisor. He's going to be babysitting series sevens. And uh, series 10, I think of uh, that, Tyler, as being kind of a a smaller version of a 24. Uh, do you already have your nine? Nine is sales supervisor. 10 doesn't work without the nine. The nine is supervising options and uh, 10 is general securities. And thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we answer any question on any NAS exam. So if you have a 10 or 24 question, I'm more than happy to uh, give it my best uh, shot in answering that. Uh, I just put up Tyler. I don't know if you saw it. Uh, we put up a series 10 in 60 minutes. <laughs> We started making these, uh, people were telling me they're watching videos uh, the night before morning of, and I thought, well, gee, you know, why don't we just make a video for that? 
And so we started by making the Series 7 in 60 Minutes. It's a, a video that you can watch the day before or morning of your exam. It's not a teaching tool. It's just to get you in the right flow, so to speak. And then we, I thought, well, what the heck? We'll do it for all the exams. So uh, we have it for SIE. We have it for 7. And I uh, did it for 24. And I just did the 10, uh, I think, Tuesday. Yeah, pass perfect. Let me, you know, uh, I think if you're scoring well on pass perfect, no doubt you're going to pass. But my goodness, do they get in the weeds on pass perfect? I mean, oh, I mean, I, this is Justin, I sometimes recommend the Kaplan Q Bank just to be able to confirm what is pass perfect's, you know, weed stuff and what is really something you need to worry about on the test. I was talking to a very senior person at uh, Kaplan and I said, man, the, the sales team at Pass Perfect needs a you know needs a bonus because I think they just in at Pass Perfect Perfect has convinced broker dealers that there's some added benefit for tormenting you uh, beyond what's necessary to pass the test and I think they sell it as like well Justin will have some sales knowledge too uh, I don't believe that Justin I believe product knowledge comes from sales efforts and not taking tests so I'm all about just helping you pass the damn exam as a rite of passage and I feel bad because some people not everybody I you know. Uh, but some people do can never get the score they need on pass perfect for their firm to allow them to move forward and take a test or move on to the next unit. So a uh, real challenge. But again, abundance is better than scarcity. So Justin, I would prefer that you have pass perfect and not another vendor who doesn't give you enough content to pass the test. Somewhere there's a happy medium there. So uh, it is definitely a lot more challenging. So, you know, if you're getting a 70 plus there, I think you're in good shape. Uh, SIE. Hey, Dean, how many hours? Hey, doctor, welcome. Uh, the doctor had a, a question for me. I never end uh, the SIE. I teach the a Kaplan class open enrollment. This might be the last opportunity because I'm not sure I'm going to do it next uh, next year. But, uh, you know, keep fresh in social media. Uh, I teach one public uh, class for Kaplan a month. I do the SIE the first month of each quarter. I do the seven. So November 8th is going to probably be my last public seven because I'm not sure I'm going to do this again next year. And then I teach in the third quarter, a third month of each quarter, the 65, 66. So we were doing the SIE and uh, we stayed a little longer because we needed to, because uh, the doctor said, Dean, do I need to be worried about tax free and tax equivalent yields? I said, almost oh, well, certainly. That's definitely on the SIE. It's on the seven, it's on the 65. So make sure you actually, you know, can uh, do that, uh, the math. Anyway, so here's the question, SIE question. How many hours? Wow. This is a tough one. Uh, and the reason I say it's tough is because it just really is depending. You know, you're honest enough to say brand spanking new. Um, I had somebody who was incredulous when I said this. So here we go. Oh, uh, I, I said, you ought to read the book cover to cover in as close to one setting as possible. <coughs> That's the beginning. They said, well, how many hours is that going to take? I said, well, I don't know. You know, read uh, for an hour, figure out how many pages you read, and then multiply it by, you know, to figure out how many hours that is. Um, so everybody be a little different, but, uh, you got to read the book. You got to exhaust the Kaplan Q bank. There's a direct correlation between exhausting the Q bank and passing the test. Uh, you've got your class. And so after class, I don't know, I would think a minimum, uh, listen on my SIE playlist, I got like 50 hours of video. So, uh, a guesstimate, but I would say 80 hours, 60, 80 hours would be my guess. Glenn, you're welcome. Welcome. Welcome to the, uh, the live stream. Um, I'm not as big a fan of training consultants as I am STC. I think STC and Kaplan, uh, we, I think hit, when I say we, I mean the collective we, because I'm an independent contractor at Kaplan. I don't get any compensation, uh, for people using the discount code or from Brian for that matter, but I am an independent contractor. So I didn't, when I say we, I wouldn't, if I didn't think Kaplan was the best, I wouldn't teach one, but I think STC and Kaplan strike that happy medium of, you know, giving you enough to pass, not too little, not too much, kind of Goldilocks and the three bears. I think training consultants can be a little thin and, you know, ugh, and I wouldn't want you to be thin. I'd want you to not be skinny on that. So with training consultants, I would strongly recommend a Kaplan Q bank as a paid supplement. On the seven, that's like a 60 bucks or the STC. STC sells their Q bank as a paid supplement. So I would recommend if you're using training consultants, uh, to get a uh, a paid supplement. And a paid supplement I would recommend would be a QBank. Uh, the Kaplan QBank is a little uh, more 
uh, more questions than uh, STC's Quebec. Uh, you know, count at STC, but you have training consultants as well. So I wouldn't be too worried about this, but it's possibly could exhaust the STC Q bank. And, and then you're getting scores because you've memorized questions. I mean, it's a champagne problem. I mean, it's better that that's the case and you haven't done enough questions, but uh, be careful. You don't do so many questions where you're just, you know, memorizing. Oh, I know it's B, A, B, C, D, A. You know, that's not where you want to be. Woohoo! Testing victory. Thank you, Glenya, a successful test taker. I always love it when Victoria's test takers uh, pop back in. It's great for morale. So if you have any questions from a real test taker who went into the cave, slayed the dragon, uh, you have one available to you here in the live stream. So feel free. I don't know how long she's going to be sticking around, but feel free to ask Glenya. Now, remember, every draw is different. So uh, 66, for those of you who don't know exams, 66 means Glenya has taken a seven and she's now an agent of a broker dealer as well as an investment advisor representative for the affiliated investment advisory firm, which means, you know, she can represent the broker dealer in charge of charging for transactions. And she can also charge, uh, participate in uh, investment advisory fees from the investment advisory firm. So uh, kudos to her. Now, if you don't have a, if you don't 763, you can't do that. You need either a a 766 or 76365 or 66365. So uh, make sure you check in with Victorious Test Takers. Uh, I've been thinking a couple of things you can uh, put in the chat too. Uh, I'm looking for a couple of recommendations. One is the channel within the next couple of weeks is going to cross a million views. And uh, that's quite a milestone. And I want to do something. I'm not sure if it's going to be a Zoom happy hour. I don't know. Lack of imagination. So if you have any, you know, social media ideas about, how we could, you know, uh, celebrate a, a million views, uh, I'd be interested. Uh, the other thing I'm going to start doing on the uh, live streams is inviting victorious test takers like Glenya to be a guest. And, uh, you know, at the beginning of the uh, live stream, you could ask them questions and they would be sharing a panel with me. Uh, I had somebody lined up to do that uh, this evening, but, you know, kind of fell through at the last minute. So, um, but, uh, you know, I'm going to start trying to do that as well. So if you're a victorious test taker and you want to pay it forward, uh, you know, just let me know. And I'm more than happy. To, you know, we won't take too long on live stream. I'm thinking maybe like the first five or 10 minutes, maybe where people could ask some questions. Yeah. Slobs over bliss, John, is worth a lot of points. Every time I think that slobs over bliss as a memory aid device has been exhausted and its ability to deliver uh, right answers, correct answers on a test, I'll be doing debrief and somebody will say, hey, Dean, with the slob is bliss thing would have worked here? I go, absolutely. Absolutely. So that one continues to pay dividends over and over and over again. Now, again, uh, I would also tell you, Gerardo, again, it's a buffet. Take what you like, leave what you don't. But some people like to do a data dump sheet. I don't like to call it a cheat sheet because I don't think you should be using that term anywhere near an exam testing site. So I call it a data dump sheet. And in the data dump sheet, uh, if you're going to do one, I think it uh, helps just get your brain flowing. Uh, but, John, I would definitely, uh, John sounds like a victorious test taker as well, Gerardo, if you're going to do a data dump sheet, I would certainly have slobs over bliss. I'd have my teeter-totter. I would have my options matrix. I would have derp. Uh, you know, there's some good ideas. Uh, you can just Google a data dump sheet or Series 7 cheat sheet, and you can see all the people who have done that. Make your own, though, by the way, because sometimes, you know, it's more confusing looking at somebody else's version. So just use that as an idea to make your own if you choose to do that. Uh, at Kaplan, I highly recommend the Kaplan Quick Sheets. Uh, the quick sheets are very helpful. It's like 20 bucks. And it also gives you ideas about things you might want to put on a data dump sheet. Gerardo, if I told you you could have one sheet of paper on it, anything front and back you wanted, what would be on that? Right. And if you thought about that right now and every night before you went to bed and every morning you waked up, you would be able to do that when you got down to the exam. Now, they're going to start your test. So they're going to make you test. But, you know, you should have plenty of time. One of my most aggravating things is when people tell me they had a time constraint, because that just means you didn't do enough practice tests. You know, that should have been something we could have taken care of in remediation by doing a practice test and, you know, picking up the speed a little bit. So anyways, my point is, if you're going to do the data dump sheet, they might make you start the time clock. Don't tell them I said this, Gerardo, but you can always pretend you don't know. I mean, they're used to being confused people. So maybe they come up to me and say, hey, you got to start the clock. Oh, oh I got to start the clock. I'm sorry. I didn't know. And I probably still wouldn't start the clock. And they come back and say, you got to start the, oh, I got to start the clock. Okay. <laughs> Quentin, all right. Another victorious test taker. So boy, in the chat, what an opportunity. You know, similar situation. I love that about the live stream. 
You know, uh, it's hard the pandemic to have a community and uh, I love it. You know, you can listen to Dean all you want, but it, I think it actually is more credible when it comes to people who have gone into the Series 7 cave and slayed that dragon. So, uh, Quentin, yeah. Hey, thanks. I so appreciate it. I love SIE people. I love getting you on the first leg of your testing journey and hoping to be there for the uh, rest of your testing journey. Uh, the way I say it, Quentin, is I come into your life for a reason and a season. The reason is to help you pass your exams. And the season is how long it takes you to matriculate. So I love being stuck for you a while, Quentin. In fact, I sometimes will post in the channel on social media when people like Quentin get through their entire testing journey. And I I get every once in a while somebody send me a you know email saying, Dean, I just want to give you a heads up. My journey is over. So I'm unsubscribing, but I appreciate your help. But <laughs> I say, well, I'm going to lose subscribers. Uh, that's definitely the way to do it. I, I, I'm not upset at all when somebody tells me, Dean, I'm done and uh, time to uh, move on. So uh, I'm glad, Quentin, I'm going to be stuck with you for a while. And remember, you don't have to unsubscribe <laughs> when you get that done. Uh, hopefully, by the time you get to the 9 and 10, I'll have some more content up there. Uh, I'm a little thin on the channel. on I'm, I, Well, thinner than I'd like to be on uh, 9 and 10. So hopefully, I'll get some more stuff up there. Uh, I'm like you guys, though. I think the most productive thing, Quentin, I could do for my 9s and 10s and 24s is queue up a 24 practice final like I've done in every other exam and go through it. But man, I just, you know, 150 questions. I just like, oh my God, I, every time I'm thinking about queuing it up and doing it, I'm like, oh man, it just doesn't speak to me. So, but I'll get it done eventually. I'll get it done eventually. You are welcome, Gerardo. You are welcome. You got a lot of good, I think, uh, input from myself and some victorious test takers. So um, make sure you said you're, I think you said you're going Monday. So uh, pay it forward like our other victorious test takers, circle back and Tuesday and, uh, you know, good news or bad news. we we're sending you good test vibes, but uh, circle back. Let us know what happens. All right. Another man. We got some good uh, victor victories here. Yassine. I like that. Yassine. I hope I'm saying that per correctly. Uh, passed the seven last week, 65 on Friday. Um, 63 is uh, a legalese. All the NAS exams are not in English. They're in legalese. And oh, my goodness. So I don't think those exams are difficult if you can figure out what you're being asked and what answers are being offered to you. Now, I would stipulate that that can be a real challenge to figure out in plain English what you're being asked and what answers are being offered to you. So in that exam, really make sure you read. I'd read the book. It's a smaller book, no matter what test prep you're under, and there's not as many performance opportunities. Uh, but Yassine, I have a great video called The Mighty 90. It's 90 minutes on the Uniform Securities Act. I believe... Somebody could pass just watching that video. I'm not want you to risk your career on that, but it's very target rich. It's one of the most popular content on the channel. So make sure you check that out. I also have a 63 practice final that you can watch me. You can hit pause and watch me do it and talk about it. And I would highly recommend that as well to get a score. And uh, what else do we have? We have a, um, a explication I'm working on. So hopefully I'll have a, something more for you up there. I don't know when you're testing, but. Last minute, sounds like you're testing pretty quick. So last minute advice is just make sure you do lots of practice questions and you read the book. Uh, are you using Kaplan? Kaplan is pretty spot on in, on NASA questions. So if you're using Kaplan, you're doing your 63 practice questions. I think you're in good shape. Well, um, I, I well, this is just personal, Cameron, and I, I, I hate to take a risk and tell you that avoid something. And then you tell me that was your entire exam. I personally think, this is just Dean speaking, Cameron, that you don't really need to spend as much time on packaged products as, uh, you know, the test prep vendors provide you. So yes, you know, you need to make sure your reps aren't doing breakpoint sales and they're not selling dividends. Uh, but I would think perhaps that would be an area where they uh, spend too much time. Um, and then I would say the same thing, Cameron, Print the PDF of the Series 10 test specifications and, uh, you know, print that out and have that as kind of a, a guideline as you're studying and uh, use it to kind of put a plus or a minus on things you probably need some more work on or less work on. So that would be how I would attack uh, the 10. Uh, well, you're going to improve. Uh, well, you're going to improve from 65. So first thing I would tell you, not like me, is you're not as far away as you probably think. So, you know, you can add a few points to that. So I just had a guy who took a practice exam Friday, Series 7, and he scored a 65. And I was pretty honest with him. I said, had that been the real test, you would have failed. But 
It's not. And as long as you don't get wobbly between now and Monday, we can certainly find those few points. So first thing is to kind of go through those uh, practice exams uh, on those four finals and see if there's some common area that you're missing. Is there? Hopefully there's something in common. It's not like a 65 all over the place. It's like I keep missing, uh, you know, multiple option strategies or I keep missing this. And then what I would say is circle back and lay some more base. Read that section again. Do some quizzes on that. Now, if it's just you're almost passing everything, there's no common thread to why you're, you know, not performing well. I mean, you're, it's a 65 across all categories in terms of subject areas. Well, then I would say you just got to stick with it. Uh, maybe give yourself a permission to take a break. So if you're studying uh, two weeks, you might just be getting mentally tired. So I'm not sure if you're a full-time test taker study or part-time, but give yourself permission to take a day off. I, uh, with two weeks out, maybe take a day or two just to refresh and reset. And you'd be surprised if you let your brain lay fallow for a little while and just put it to rest for a little bit and then come back to it. That might, that might take you over the top. I had uh, one guy, uh, and we noticed that what it was about halfway through, he started missing questions. And I said, well, set the clock so you know and take a 15-minute break about, you know, question 70 or somewhere about halfway through so you know that you can do that. I mean, even if you're just sitting at your chair at the Prometric site and taking a mental trip to Tahiti for 10 minutes and refreshing and resettling and saying, okay, got to finish this thing up. Uh, that can be a difference in the score. So maybe do that. Maybe take, you know, if it's half or third, maybe 40, 50 questions, take a break. Uh, what we want to kind of figure out is, is it a rhythm thing or is it a, a content thing? So I've seen both. I've seen where people uh, can't push it into the 70 range because they don't have enough base, but I've also just seen where they're just tired. So try and, try and isolate it a little bit more on the variables about why that is. But again, you still got to be resilient. So the worst thing you can do is not continue to work, right? So you've done four finals. You got to stick with it. So you got two more weeks. So you, you know, you're in your future, there are at least five or six more finals. So, you know, so pace yourself. Uh, but, you know, just know that's part of the process and you got to keep grinding. As I always tell people, keep grinding, stay the course and be resilient to negative feedback because negative feedback is positive, right? I mean, I, it's counterintuitive, but if you say, Dean, I missed 200 questions a day, I go, that's wonderful. Let's see if we can miss 300 tomorrow because that is part of the process. So I would just try and embrace that as uh, much as possible, that part of the process is uh, getting a new plateau. And usually people break through. So, you know, I don't know if it's going to be your fifth final or your sixth final, but, you know, I think with two weeks, we're going to have a breakthrough and you'll get into that uh, mid-70 range. And then don't be upset. Sometimes, you know, you might take another final and you might have a serious setback in terms of score. And when people call me that, I say, well, man, do another one right now. Let's get that bad taste, you know, out, out of your mouth in terms of getting us something uh, you know, a bad score. A bad score would be below 60. So that would be my recommendation for you. Uh, just embrace it, part of the process. I'm I'm so happy you've taken four finals because I can't tell you how many people avoid taking finals. And it's aggravating because they don't find out that they're struggling and need remediation. So you know, and that's, you know, knowing is half the battle. So knowing you're at 65 and want to get to 70 is way ahead of a lot of people right now who don't even know they're not in the 70 range or the 60 range for that matter. So, you know, put yourself on a pace that, uh, you know, you're going to maybe do one every third day or second day and just embrace it as a part of the process. Uh, maybe in the chat, some of our successful test takers can give you some hints as well. Uh, Justin, thank you, my coworker. Uh, yeah, I was really surprised, Justin. I had somebody tell me they're watching it at work together. So that warms my heart. That's wonderful. Uh, the channel has grown as a direct result of victorious test takers and uh, referrals from this victorious test taker. So uh, we love referrals. I think that's what's got us to almost a million views. I'm not a, a, a asshole. An asshole in my world is somebody who's always asking to like my videos and subscribe to my videos. I I just, you know, when I started, I started, I, and don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe. I'm more after views and helping people. But uh, that being said, we've, you know, got coming up on 10,000 subscribers and uh, a million views. So Somebody out there is watching. Maybe it's just Justin and his coworkers watching the same video a hundred times. Uh, I was thinking, Justin, of doing something in Vegas. I told you, I'm trying to think of some way to celebrate our million view milestone. And I don't know how many people want to hop on a flight and come to Vegas, but I'm more than happy to, you know, do something at this, you know, South Coast or something like that. Uh, pass the SIE. All right. The victory. Uh, you know, the vict uh, ver journey of three and O. Oh. I call that the hat trick, right? Three and out. You pass your SIE, you pass your seven, you pass your 66, or 
SIE 663 or SIE. That 3-0 journey begins with the first journey, right? The first victory, which is the SIE. And so, man, if you can, you know, I was just telling the SIE class today, you know, it pays huge dividends to get off to a good start and get that first victory. And, uh, you know, you don't want to just barely pass your SIE. You want to, uh, you know, uh, pass it well. We won't give you a score if you pass, but I'll promise you it'll pay dividends. You can almost pass out of a six based on your six uh, SIE and then seven will just pay huge dividends. So you know, there's only three or four options on the SIE, but, you know, seven, there's going to be, you know, lots of them. Uh, Pre-test today. Uh, cool. Uh, now staying for the seven a couple weeks. Yeah, that's a good. I like it, Cody. A couple weeks should be be able to get it. Uh, I'm not sure what I said, Jess. Say that again. It sounds so fancy. I'm, I'm not sure what I said. <laughs> you know, so, uh, good news. There's a replay. It's a, it lives forever in videos. So uh, maybe you know, maybe I'll we'll find it again. Maybe I'll somebody. I think uh, what fancy word I use. I think uh, I use two fancy words. I think matriculate. Matriculate just means you know moving forward in the process. That's I e. And I think I use remediation. That sounds like a bad word, but that's a good word. That means. You know, like we we're just talking. I forget who it was. Uh, I think it was uh, uh, not like me, right? We're talking about remediation. How are we going to fix something as you want? So here's some good debrief. Uh, tenure, that's really a good one, right? Good debrief. Thanks, Glenn. Your tenure is important because remember the fund manager, should he be held accountable or not uh, for the uh, mutual fund performance? So, you know, you say, Dean, you're showing me the 10-year track record, and it's not so good. I can't believe you're recommending the fund. I say, well, there's a new guy, and that's not his record. Or, you know, uh, vice versa. I say, well, this is a good record, and it's been uh, accomplished by this manager. Uh, net present value, Glenn, was it inputs or now puts? I don't think we made you calculate. I hope not. Uh, if you're taking a 6566, uh, you need to know that discounted cash flow is how we arrive at uh, net present value. And we're going to do that for, you know, discounted cash flow is about a series of future income streams. So anything that has a set of future income streams, we can do what's called DCF. If we do it on stocks with dividends, it's called the dividend discount model. And if we're doing it, uh, we can't use it on preferred stock, the growth model. Growth model would be where we assume the dividend is going to go up. So, for example, I always use uh, Berkshire Hathaway Investment in Bank of America. You know, Berkshire Hathaway says if we buy Bank of America, we're going to get 22 cent quarterly dividends. Four times a year, we're getting 22 cents. We're going to get that 22 cents for, you know, however many years, forever perhaps. What would we be willing to pay now for that future set of income streams? And that will give us a present value, a price at which we would think Bank of America is a good deal or a bad deal. Uh, I don't think that's all called quantitative analysis. It includes a balance sheet, and I don't think it'll cause you to pass or fail, uh, but it's there. So what I mean by that is, you know, make sure you know there's other things. Half the exam is don't lie, cheat, or steal. So, you know, study accordingly. Well, absolutely. <laughs> Antonio, absolutely. I, I tease the guy who's in charge of the Kaplan book. It keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger, even though the test doesn't change. My God, I think there's like a thousand pages in there. So absolutely. The QBank's 3,800 questions. So uh, I think the challenges are going to be able to get through all the Kaplan content that's available for you. So absolutely. Uh, I would tell you that there's a direct correlation. Antonio, if I were your accountability partner, you missed the mark and you're Kaplan. You know, at Kaplan, you know, if you're working for a major firm, uh, I have a administrator key where I can go backstage and see what you've done in terms of your QBank. And boy, if you miss the exam, the first thing I'm going to do is pull up your Kaplan QBank and see how many practice questions you did. And again, that's going to be a kind of an issue if you haven't done enough of them, right? There's a direct correlation to, I call it QBank usage and passing the test. So Antonio, you don't have a challenge uh, in terms of having uh, enough material from Gallon. It's actually uh, going to be a challenge for you to get through all of it. So uh, good news. Yeah, you have plenty of content, plenty of content. Yeah, Glenn, yeah, Brian's Test Geek Finals. Brian and I are a bridge to the actual exam. So there's nothing on my channel and in Brian's content that isn't about helping you pass the actual exam. We don't have any agenda about trying to sell you stuff. So, you know, every once in a while, somebody sent me a cap and question. I'm like, oh, yeah, this isn't on the exam, but, you know, it's a nice, nice brain teaser. So, yeah, uh, the one that somebody told me they saw the other day, Glenn, yeah, and uh, maybe you saw it was uh, about uh, the step in a cost base. And I think there was like something like a ring 
And Brian has almost that exact question uh, verbatim. So I think we did that one already. Let's see. Am I falling behind here? Yeah, I, I really do the Quebec. I just think it's good to get, uh, you know, the Kaplan Quebec because what you if you have more than one study material, you know, nobody's. I don't think anybody's monogamous about g getting help. I mean, you know, I'm sure if you're using my channel, you're probably using other channels. I mean, whoever helps you, right? If you have a Kaplan, maybe you have a achievable, whatever. Uh, but that being said, I really think the Kaplan Quebec in a conjunction with Past Perfect. When you, by the way, it's anytime you have multiple vendors, it helps you confirm test issues. So if you have Past Perfect, you have Kaplan, you're watching the channel, you got Test Geek, and everybody says it's on the test, well, then it's on the test. And, you know, if you, you know, have one provider say it's there and then nobody else does, and that, that's typical of Past Perfect, by the way. There are all kinds of Past Perfect questions where, you know, people like Dean and Brian and, you know, Ken are going to say, well, don't worry about it because we know it's not on the test. But, you know, Past Perfect has more of that than others. And that's why I would recommend that uh, Kaplan Quebec. I think we did that one. I'm not sure what I'm doing here. Maybe I'm messing up the, the chat. Those scores are exasperating, exasperating. Uh, well, okay, let's talk about that pretty quickly. So, you know, uh, officers, directors, and principal stockholders are called control persons. Control persons. And all the stock that they and their immediate family members own is called control stock. So, you know, for example, uh, Tesla invited Larry Ellison to become a board member. And to show his support, he accepted. And he went into the open market and he bought 3 million shares of Tesla. He bought it in the open market. Andrea, that stock is registered. It is not restricted. There is no holding period on the Tesla stock that Larry bought in the open market. Now, if Tesla gives Larry a million shares for serving on the board, that is stock he got directly from Tesla and that stock is unregistered. And it's called restricted stock because it's restricted in its ability to transfer it. So if it's restricted stock, AKA unregistered stock. Now in the old days, when we had physical stock certificates, we would have red letters on there that said stop transfer. And so regardless of how Larry got the Tesla stock, right? He got some of the stock in the open market and he got some directly from Tesla. It's all called control stock and he's going to be subject to the volume limitations. Now, the stock he got directly from Tesla is restricted. He has to hold it for at least six months. So, you know, that's the restricted stock. And then remember, he can sell, so he has to file the form. We're not going to, since he bought the stock, Tesla did five for one split, so now he has 15 million shares. We're not going to let Larry Ellison call his broker and say, sell 15 million shares of Tesla at the market, because the public market would tank. And there's this dog. There's a dog that protects the public marketplace. It's called the SEC. And this dog not only barks, it bites. And so if Larry wants to sell any Tesla stock, He's going to have to file Form 144. This is testable on the SIE. It's testable on the 7. It's testable on the 10, the 24. And he files that at or prior to the transaction. You know, he can't do it after the fact. So the 144 has two components. Part of 144 is how we turn unregistered stock into registered stock so we can sell it. Hold it for six months. The second component of 144 is volume limitations for control persons. And I think a good way to remember it, Andrea, is 144. 144. 1%. So Larry files the form. He can sell 1% of the outstanding stock of Tesla, one, or the average of the last four weeks trading volume, four, whichever is greater four times a year, every 90 days. So 144. All right, so uh, good news, 68. You don't need to find many new uh, more points, but that's certainly one of them. So control stock is all the stock held by the officer, directors, principal stockholders, right? Ford Motor Company. The control stock is all the stock owned by the Ford family. And regardless of how the Ford family got that stock in the open market or whether they got it directly from Ford, 
you know, uh, it doesn't matter. They're subject to the volume limitation. So I hope that was helpful. Uh, I do have a little lecture on that as well. Uh, you can get tutoring. Uh, I have a tutoring. I use an automated tutoring page. It's Dean Tinney Tutoring, lack of imagination, dot setmore.com. I really, really book, but you just go there and it'll tell you what times are available and you uh, can, you know, book a time to get some help. Uh, well, thank you, Cameron. I love it. Uh, DPP's Drug Participation Program, Series 10, Cameron. Cameron, thanks for joining us as a sales supervisor. Uh, the task question on DPPs, there's two of them. So I wouldn't spend a lot of time. I don't know if our Series 10s are still here, but this would not be a, a target-rich environment. Uh, when we do roll-ups on partnerships, Cameron, this is testable. We uh, can't charge more than 2%. So let me give you a, a quick example of that. Uh, you know, we are doing uh, Del Taco Restaurant Properties 1. Uh, we raise 8 to $12 million. We buy all-cash real estate. We build Del Tacos. We do Del Taco Restaurant Properties 2, 3, 4. And so now we have these uh, four partnerships. And we decide, well, why should we be filing four sets of 10 Qs and four annual reports? We decide to roll them all into one Del Taco Restaurant Properties partnership. That's called a roll-up. Two test questions about partnerships. I can't charge more than 2% for the roll-up. That is very testable on 10 and 24. The second test question is that our reps can't use their discretionary authority uh, to uh, put somebody into a partnership, direct participation program. I see, Cameron, beautiful picture of you there at Schwab. Uh, and uh, I used Schwab when I was an investment advisor uh, for custody execution. And uh, I did a trade at Schwab and I was like six figures plus that they charged me like $9 and 95 cents. I said, my God, I can't believe they can process a trade for 10 bucks. Anyways, I was thinking in my own mind, Cameron, let's see if you get this. If I put you into a partnership like a winery in Napa, same hundred grand, Dean makes $10,000. So we think that compromises your rep's ability to decide, does somebody need an ETF with a $10 commission or do they need to be a partner in a winery? <laughs> so I say, hey, listen, uh, Cameron, I think you should make an asset allocation of this winery in Napa. And you say, Dean, I have to, you have discretionary authority. I don't know why you're bothering me. I say, well, I'm not allowed to use my discretionary authority when there's a uh, when it's a partnership, right? So that's the question about partnerships on the 10. Uh, I wouldn't get too big. Yeah, one more, I, as I'm thinking about it. The other thing is lack of liquidity. So remember, you can't get in or out of the partnership with in without admission, admittance to the general partner. And more importantly, you can't leave, be emitted without the general partner. So lack of liquidity. So Cameron is a supervisor, sales supervisor, making sure if we have rep putting somebody in a partnership that it's not money that needs to be liquid. I hope that was helpful. Oh, that's great. Razzle, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Razzle, that's fantastic. I wouldn't be worried at all. Wouldn't be worried at all. Uh, advanced options, remember, are spreads and straddles. So I have some videos. So what you got to be able to do on your Series 7 for spreads and straddles, a uh, spread, you got to be able to identify it. You got to do debit or credit, exercise or expire, widen or narrow, max gain, max loss, break even, bullish or bearish. I call that razzle, don't hate the eight. Don't hate the eight, right? If you do that in a menu way, you know, I have videos on it. You do it now on your straddle. What you got to be able to do on the test is identify a straddle, calculate the break evens, determine where it's profitable. We got a great memory aid for that. Silo, short inside, long outside. Where is the straddle profitable? Right. And those are the four things. Pretty straightforward. Uh, and then we have straddles with different strike prices called combinations. And God knows, Razzle, I don't know if you how much of a user of the channel you are, but I have a series seven options playlist. My God, I have 21 videos in there. I literally have hours of videos. Uh, and on advanced options, I have a longer lecture. It's the uh, third video in the playlist. And then I have a, what I call carve outs, where I just show you a spread and I just show you a straddle. Then I show you a debit spread and credit spread, you know. So yeah, maybe you want to check that out as well. Uh, I just also, Razzle, put up a 100 uh, question option practice test. So we got, man, I'll tell you, if, uh, if you're struggling with options, we we got plenty of content on the channel for that, for sure. Uh, series 7, by the way, is the only uh, series exam where I have more than one playlist. So, you know, most of the time you just go to the SIE and that's all the videos for that are there. But on 7, I have uh, six different playlists. I have my explication of the Series 7 content outline. 
I have uh, narrative lectures, like, you know, our lecture on munis or equity securities, whatever the case. I have an options playlist. I have a practice test playlist. I have tutoring replays. And then I also have a suitability playlist where I have uh, four hours, four separate videos on suitability. So listen, if you if you need Series 7 content uh, free to supplement your paid materials, uh, the channel is for you for sure. Yeah, I think so, Glenn. Yeah, Kaplan, by design, by the way, you want it to be harder, not easier. So, you know, that's a good thing. Yeah, I think, you know, that's by design. Yeah, the immediate family member, remember, Cameron, so another thing for Andrea, remember your aunt, your uncle, your grandma, your grandpa are not immediate family members. But remember, they slide back into what we call restricted persons if uh, they are financially dependent. You know, the idea here is that uh, if I have an IPO, IPO stands for instant profit opportunity. I'm kidding. But the idea here is what I'd like to do is withhold the IPO and give it to my grandmother and make her financially independent so I don't have to pay any more for her bills or for bingo. And so if they're financially dependent, they slide back into the category of being a restricted person. So by the way, that that's a different term than restricted stock. Restricted persons are restricted in terms of their ability to have an IPO allocation. Now, Cameron, I think you were a Series 10. And on the 10, you need to know, Cameron, that if our own company is going public, then we're not restricted. So Fidelity is privately held. And if Fidelity went public, Fidelity employees would be able to buy Fidelity stock. That's a good thing, right? So you're not restricted if it's your own company, your own broker dealer that is going public. Well, thank you. I mean, I'm new to social media, but I'm not new to helping people pass their tests. I never had any haters until I got on social media. Now I have some haters and, you know, uh, I think they think I'm new or something. I mean, I'm new to social media, but I've been doing this an awful long time. So, uh, Eric, Nick, everybody's different. I don't know. We have some victorious test takers. Anybody want to give uh, Nick some insight? I would, it's, I think it depends. You got to read the book. You got to do the questions. You got to watch uh, on-demand videos or go to a class. So I'm thinking at least, uh, what, 60, 80 hours? That would be my guesstimate, Nick. I mean, you know, I'm just basing on how long it's going to take you to read the book, how uh, you're going to have a go to class, I hope. If not, you know, I think classes are really undervalued. I mean, you should go to class if you can. Uh, you're going to have to do all your practice questions. So I think that will unfold as you begin your study effort. So I would make a list of what is my study plan. You know, you want to be dedicated, disciplined, and organized. So I would make a list of all my resources and uh, all my activities. And then what I suggest you do is carve up what I call study blocks. So, you know, most people aren't wired for like two hours. So like, don't, don't kid yourself. A study block should be 45 minutes, an hour and a half. If you're a part-time studier, I would suggest in the morning and it's going to be weekends. And then I would ask how many study blocks are you going to commit to? And then I would like in each study block you to be doing a different activity. So, you know, if you're going to read the next study block, watch a video, next study block, do some questions. I'd also like you to change the subject. So if you're doing options, next study block, do munis, you'll stay fresher. And Nick, you'll, as that unfolds, you'll get a better idea how long it's going to take you on your study blocks to get through and how many study blocks you're going to need. And then what I would do is just multiply that. And you can adjust it as you start your journey, right? So I would do my first week and then sit down with myself and say, hey, self, uh, man, this is taking me a lot longer than I thought, or I think I'm getting through this a little quicker. You know, maybe you get a test date. I think if you don't have a test date, I highly recommend getting one because it will help you in that regard. Having a test date will have your brain kind of draw you to the material. If you don't have a test date, it's hard for your brain to kind of accept this idea, you know, that I'm going to sit down and start doing it. So get a test date if you don't have one. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I love Schwab. You know, I've been around with Schwab when they were in San Francisco, and Chuck. And I think it's funny, sometimes when Chuck is in San Francisco, he'll be having lunch and people say, oh, you mean you're the guy who plays Chuck Schwab? <laughs> we have to tell them, no, that's really a real person. Uh, if you haven't done it, Cameron, every 9, 10, 24 should read his book, Invested. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that uh, is testable based on his journey. Uh, so Chuck Schwab's book is called Invested. Ricketts, TD Ameritrade, his book is called The Harder I Work, The Luckier I Get. I, I, if you, know, you were working at my firm and you were 9, 10, or 24, I would make that mandatory reading. There's all kinds of stuff about net capital and sales supervision and now, it only takes, Cameron, one story, Chuck uh, Schwab had a customer nearly took Schwab with him when he went under. And Chuck said, never again will we have a customer 
who if they you know go under has taken us with them. And he's explaining why Schwab has some of the highest house requirements on the street. You know, and a lot of people get upset, right? I'm sure Cameron getting his 10 noses, people, oh man, you know, at E Trade, you know, and <laughs> I, I'm sure Cam would be more tactful than I would be. I'd say, well, you know, E Trade is E Trade and Schwab is Schwab. Uh, I don't think, Razel, that you're going to see a butterfly or a ratio right on your seven. I mean, I have a video on butterfly spreads in my series four playlist for registered option principles. And I also in that uh, playlist have a video for ratio rights, but I have it in the four playlist and not the seven, just because I don't really think that I don't think it lends itself well to a dump sheet and it doesn't, I don't think you're going to see it. Do we have any victorious test takers uh, still in the chat who took a seven? Did you see a butterfly or a ratio? A butterfly, by the way, is just a long spread. It's two spreads, basically. You know, you have a, you know, two short options and then a long option. If we're looking at a graph, uh, that's what it would look like. So uh, I would tell you, Rizal, if you tell me that you missed your mark because of butterflies and ratio rights, I'm going to say, eh. Now, on a ratio right, Rizal, there is one question, and it's not can you recognize a ratio right. It's just to recognize, Rizal, there's nothing uh, as partially naked, right? So if I own 100 shares and write two, uh, two calls, you do need to recognize on the test that that's unlimited risk. You're not going to have to know it's a ratio, right? You're just going to have to know it's unlimited risk. Yeah, I think it's really depends on the firm, right on, Glenn? You're right, because I know some of you are full-time test takers getting paid to do nothing but study and pass your exams. And other of you I know are part-time studiers and you're carving this out. I had a single mom. I'm, I'm not as empathetic with people based on this single mom. She was studying before she sent the kids to school in the morning on weekends. And, uh, you know, she passed her exam. I mean, that's just really difficult. I mean, you know, I, I, I have nothing but respect for somebody like that. So... It depends on the circumstances you're in. So if you're a paid test, take, test taker, obviously the expectations are a little higher, right? So, you know, Cameron's a Schwabi and Schwabies get, when they get hired, I don't know, Cameron, if they know how good they have it at Schwab as a, a brand new Schwabi because, you know, they're getting paid to study and pass their exam. So there is going to definitely be a higher expert, exp, uh, expectation. Okay, we're at our hour. So let me just finish up these chats here. and We'll call it a night. You guys have been great and I'll see you next Tuesday. Um, Oh, thank you, John. Thank you. I, no, I'm not everybody's cup of tea. I had a guy who said, you know, I tell too many stories. I said, well, good news and bad news. Good news is I am who I am and I'm not changing. And the bad news is I am who I am and I'm not changing. So good news for you. There's other channels. If you don't like my stories and change the channel. So thank you, John. Sometimes it's encouraging. Some days, you know, most, most of the time I'm getting a lot of love, but every once in a while I'm like, man, nobody loves me. You know, so... 100 hours? I'm, I'm not surprised. You're sitting on 100 hours. Wow. Uh, 70 is where you need to be. Taxes won't be a big deal. You're supposed to help people go get their taxes. Don, I have a video on that, but make sure you know cost basis. Make sure you know what is and is not a taxable event. Cash dividends are taxable. Stock dividends and splits are not. Converting a bond is not a taxable event. So those kind of things, right? So, uh, But if you tell me again, it's like Rizal telling me he missed the mark because of butterfly spreads. If you tell me you were scoring 70s on Kaplan and you missed it because of taxes, I'm going to say, I don't believe you. There's got to be some other problem there. Yeah, at least a month, I think at least. You're welcome. You're welcome. Anybody got anything else? Let me just see here. Here's one more. Yeah, I can't. Uh, another Schwabi. Uh, Quinn, I, I just wish I could get people. Now, there's some people that tell people you don't want to you don't want to damage your confidence by taking practice tests and not scoring well. <laughs> I don't know how else you find out where you're at. So I'm with you, Quinn. I would just tell you again, it's a buffet. Take what you like, leave what you don't. But again, that's another common thing that people have in common when they don't pass. You know, on social media, on the Reddit, I can't tell you how many times when somebody doesn't pass, they don't tell us what their practice scores are. And the first thing I ask is what were you scoring on practice exams? How many did you do? And did you change answers? And it's just, you know, exasperating when they should do more, right? They should have more QBank usage and they should do more. So I'm glad, Quentin, that uh, I'm with you five to eight. You know, the, the, the people who don't pass haven't done enough. So people are usually undershooting the number of practice exams they should do. You bet. You're welcome. Uh, on the actual exam, uh, they might have used an iron condor as a distractor. Distractors are technical, uh, the technical term for a wrong answer. And so I can't, I, can, I would be, John, 
willing to concede that perhaps you had a, a choice C as a butterfly spread and choice D as an iron condor. But I don't think it was the right answer. I think the right answer would be A, a calendar spread or B, a price spread. So remember, distractors are wrong answers. So don't be taking, you know, don't pick an answer that you don't know what it is. John, if this guy can pass, you can pass. You know, I was debriefing him and he, he said, Dean, what's a Murphy account? I said, I have no idea what a Murphy account is. I've never heard of such a thing. I'm, I don't know, an account that goes the wrong way all the time. And he goes, well, why didn't you tell me there's no such thing as a Murphy account? I said, well, because they don't exist. I mean, we have cash accounts and up my accounts and margin accounts. And I said, well, why would you pick that as an answer? And he said, well, you know, you never talked about it. I wasn't in any of my study materials, so I figured it was the right answer. Ladies and gentlemen, I can assure you that if we have not talked about it ever, it's not in any of your study materials. It's a heck of a distractor, you know, that they're trying to bait you with. You know, uh, I was John coming up with a uh, a flamingo as a distractor, <laughs> you know, <laughs> iron condor, butterfly, flamingo. <laughs> and I used it as a distractor. And I can't tell you, John, how many people were calling me saying, what, what? I've never heard of an option strategy, flamingo. What the hell is a flamingo? I said, it's a wrong answer. That's what it is. So, you know, be careful. Be careful. All right, uh, ladies and gents, thanks for joining me on this Tuesday. Uh, see you next Tuesday. Make sure you tell your uh, test-taking friends that we're every, uh, here every Tuesday uh, doing uh, what we did tonight. So anything else before we call it a night? 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. All right, everybody. See you next time. Bye-bye.